Hello and welcome to Perspectives. I'm Setaria Derakhshesh. On today's program, we take a break from politics and turn our attention to culture with visits to two American museums, New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art, an American Grand Dame of international culture, and the younger but vibrant Freer Sackler Galleries here in Washington, D.C. The Metropolitan Museum and Freer Gallery are currently featuring exhibitions of what is collectively referred to as Islamic art, artistic traditions that sprang from the advent of Islam in the late 7th century. Their richness and diversity reflect the vast geographic span of Islamic cultures. The Sackler is celebrating its 25th anniversary with an exhibit titled Feast Your Eyes, A Taste for Luxury in Ancient Iran. Intricate metal works in gold and silver dating back to the Hashemite kings. But first, we take you to New York and an exhibit that features 15 different galleries reflecting the great sweep of ancient Islamic culture. The Metropolitan Museum of Art is a treasure chest holding over two million artifacts. Tens of thousands of these are on exhibit at any given time in the museum's more than two million square feet. The Met, as New Yorkers call it, was incorporated in 1870. The day we visited, there were 21 exhibits to choose from, on subjects ranging from 8th century Tibetan armor to objects from the Greek Bronze Age, American baseball history, modern design, and Fabergé eggs. The Metropolitan's collection of Islamic art is one of the world's finest. It comprises more than 12,000 works of art created over a span of 13 centuries. They were acquired by gift and purchase throughout the museum's 140-year history. This vast collection is grouped in several newly renovated galleries, the result of a $50 million undertaking that was completed last November. Mariam Ehtiar, Senior Research Associate in the Department of Islamic Art at the museum, gave us a tour. Tell us about this exhibit and how long did it take to put this together? Well, um, this is a project that took eight years. It was a construction project that involved recreating 15 new galleries dedicated to the arts of the Arab lands, Turkey, Iran, Central Asia, and later South Asia. And it was, of course, a collaborative effort of many people. Mm -hmm. Now tell us about the architecture here. Yeah, well, this is a very special area of our galleries. This is what we refer to as the Andalusian court. It's a structure which was built on site by about 15 um, Moroccan craftsmen who carved the plaster, carved the woodwork, uh, did the, the tile work right here on site. And so we watched them transform the space from beams and bare walls and bricks to this wonderful interior. And uh, it was uh, quite an experience. The 15 galleries are grouped by geography, Middle East to North Africa, Europe and Central and South Asia, from Spain in the West to India in the East. The museum says this new geographic presentation represents the plurality of the Islamic tradition. Whatever the medium or architectural element, no matter what the country of origin, the artifacts are linked by the use of Arabic script and love of intricate embellishment. Maryam Ikhtiar brings us to one of the finest examples, a mihrab that was first displayed at the museum in 1939. Now this mihrab, tell us about that. It looks also like it's from Isfahan. Yes, this is a mihrab which is a very elaborate niche from a uh, a religious school in Isfahan dated to the Ilkhanid period, 14th century. It comprises a lot of different kinds of ornament that are very characteristic of the art of this region. One is uh, the vegetal ornament, the uh, geometric ornament, and the calligraphic ornament. There are three inscriptions on this. One is uh, the frame, which is a surah from the Quran. There is another inscription which outlines the niche, which are the five pillars of Islam. And then there is a very interesting inscription, which is one of the hadith or the sayings of the Prophet that says the mosque is the abode of all pious believers. This is uh, actually one of the great objects in our collection 
and is noted for its uh, visual impact and color. In another gallery, a brilliant display of Persian carpets from the 16th to 19th centuries. Its centerpiece, the classical emperor's carpet that was presented to Habsburg Emperor Leopold I by Tsar Peter the Great of Russia. This carpet that we see here is a very important carpet in the collection and it was in a state of disrepair before it was conserved for three years. It's on display for the first time in a permanent collection. Because of its inscription and of course its size, we think it was produced for one of the early Safavid rulers, probably Shah Tahmas. We know that it's one of a pair and the pair is in Vienna. We also know what the inscription says, which is a poem by the uh, medieval poet Zahir al-Din Faryabi about the coming of spring. Now, this leads us to believe that this and its pair might have been intended as a New Year's gift. These ceramics were made with the Minai glazing technique developed during the Saljuq period between the 12th and 13th centuries in Iran. The pottery is known for its bright colors and intricate designs. What is Minai? What kind of a technique is Minai? Minai is a very complex technique which involves several firings in the kiln, which produces like this manuscript-like painting on a bowl or on a vessel. This is done several times because... Because there are so many colors involved, there are at least seven, and the more stable colors are have to be fired separately and the less stable colors separately so that all of them adhere perfectly. And you can see the state of preservation of these is, is remarkable. Now, this is a scene from the Shahnameh. Well, this is a, a very popular story from the Shahnameh called the um, story of Bahram Agur and Azadeh who go on a hunt. And she's accompanying him and playing the harp while they're hunting and of course she challenges him and to make a long story short he, he is very offended and throws her off of the camel so you have her on the camel and on the ground so it's two moments conflated into one in both of these bowls in fact uh, depict the same story. The Shahnameh or Book of Kings is an epic poem in 50,000 rhyming couplets. It tells the tales of the ancient kings of Iran from the mythical beginnings to the Arab conquest and was completed by Abul Ghassem Ferdowsi in the early 11th century. These pages on display are from a 16th century Shahnameh that the Metropolitan describes as the most luxuriously illustrated copy ever produced in the history of Persian painting. It's a mixture of history and legend. We have pages from one of the greatest Shahnameh ever produced here in the collection. We have 78 illustrated manuscript pages from the Shah Tahmas Shahnameh that was painted over two generations or two decades. We have 12 of them out and they rotate due to the sensitivity to light. There are other brilliant and delicate artifacts such as these pages from an illustrated collection of parables. These are illustrated folios from one of the great manuscripts in our collection called the Conference of the Birds, the Mantegatayr, by Farid Din Attar, and it's a mystical poem. The interesting aspect about this manuscript was that, for the most part, it was produced in Herat, in, under the Timurids, uh, in the court of Sultan Hussein Baikara. And uh, then, uh, at a different stage, under Shah Abbas, there were a number of pages added. We don't have a signature. We can attribute the paintings of some of these paintings to the great painter Behzad of the Timurid period. The Saljurs were a Turkish dynasty whose 11th century empire encompassed Iraq, Iran, and much of Anatolia. These would have been part of a wall of such statues. They are two Salju princes from a palace. These are very interesting because not only the headdresses point to the fact that they're princes and the jewelry, but also the physiognomy of the faces is very much sort of uh, the Central Asian type. This was an ideal of beauty that endured all the way through the end of the 16th and 17th century. Restoration began in 2008 of one of the highlights of the Met's exhibit, the so-called Damascus Room. 
Built in 1707, the museum describes the sumptuously ornamented reception room as one of the finest examples of a well-to-do Syrian's home during the Ottoman period. It was a gift to the museum in 1970. The project, to conserve as well as restore the room, involved over 200 elements. The materials used include iron, brass, different woods, mother of pearl, and marble, glass, and ceramics. The spectacular room stands almost seven meters by five meters. We end our visit to the Metropolitan Museum of Art with this bronze lion. He stands almost one meter square and was found in Khorasan, eastern Iran. He seems to know he's a crowd pleaser. When we were talking, you mentioned that this piece is one of the most popular. Yes, it's an incense it's burner in the Iran. shape of a lion from Iran, from the Seljuk period, about the uh, late 12th century. And uh, it consists of two parts. And you would take off the head and place the uh, incense into the body and light it up. And the fumes would be coming from all these perforations and from the eyes and the mouth. So it's quite, quite spectacular. The whole exhibit is spectacular. If you'd like to see more, please visit the Metropolitan's website at www.metmuseum.org. Next, we take you here in Washington to the Smithsonian Institution's Museum for Asian Art, the Freer Sackler Galleries. Nestled on the National Mall between the Capitol and the Washington Monument, the neighboring galleries hold some of the finest Islamic artwork in the world. We start in the Freer Gallery, named after collector Charles Lang Freer. It's the Smithsonian's first art museum. It took an act of Congress to establish the museum in 1921 because up until then, the Smithsonian collections were only scientific in nature. Freer's legacy of about 7,500 works of Asian art has grown through purchases and gifts to more than 22,000 objects from across Asia and parts of the Middle East. That's where Perspective's Carla Bab met up with the chief curator of the Freer Sackler Galleries, Masume Farhat. Now this exhibit, The Arts of the Islamic World, how long has this been at the Freer Gallery? Freer started collecting Islamic art in 1902. Um, so some of the objects here date from that period. He gave his collection um, to the nation and to the Smithsonian. And uh, subsequently, though, um, various directors have added to the collection and today it's one of the finest um, collections of Islamic art, in particular Persian art, in the world. Let's start off with this one. I mean, what is this? This is wonderful because um, to me it's, it looks obvious what it is, but a lot of visitors always sort of ask, well, what is this exactly? And it's a candlestick. We don't know exactly where it would have been placed, but we assume probably in a large palatial or grand setting, I mean, given its size, and it probably had another pair. Usually um, they come in, in pairs, and the candle would go right where um, the opening is. Okay, now what would this candle be used for? I mean, obviously not daily use because that's gold, right? Or is that, what material is that? One sort of great characteristic of Islamic art is uh, this particular technique, which is taking base metals, in particular brass, and then inlaying them with silver and gold, because you could only have that many gold objects. So in order to, in a way, imitate um, sort of precious objects, this is a technique that was developed in the Islamic world, and you can see it, it, you know, it fools everyone. So was this ceremonial? Actually, um, what is interesting about the arts of the Islamic world across the board is they all are associated with a function. Now, the function could, could have been, um, as you say, ceremonial, and some objects were rarely used. Again, we don't really know how often and in what context it was used. It was probably used um, in a secular context, and again, from the wear and tear, it was not used probably every day, because it's, um, it dates from the middle of the um, 12th century, and it's still um, in pretty good shape. Well, let's, let's move on to something that was used on an everyday basis. So this piece is part of a mirab? Yes. This is a, um, a wonderful example of 14th century tile work. 
and which is associated uh, particularly with the Mongol Ilkhanate. The Mongols uh, conquered much of the Near East in the middle of the 13th century, and um, even though they're associated with you know, great destruction, what is interesting is that in the 14th century, they also became some of the greatest patrons of architecture, uh, painting, and ceramics. What is really remarkable about this piece is you can sort of see it's, it's shiny, and that is the use of luster paint that gives it this glistening surface texture. Now, how did they make luster? Luster is made from various oxides, and it's painted um, on the ceramic piece, and then the ceramic is reheated to a very specific temperature for the luster to adhere um, to the surface. And um, often if, if it's too hot or the temperature is too high or too low, the luster sort of turns sort of brown and is not as lustrous as it's supposed to be. Are all of your pieces here in the arts of the Islamic world Islamic? There are some that have religious connotations, and you know, like this mehrab used within uh, a mosque, we have examples of Qurans, we have uh, mosque lamps, um, but really most of the objects on view are um, objects that were made for a, for a secular context. So let's go check out some more of those secular pieces. Yes. These are canteens, is that right? Yes. This actually, the, the metal canteen here is one of the great icons of the entire history of Islamic art. In fact, it's the object that has been written about more than any other object. This has been discussed extensively and we still don't exactly know for whom it was made and where it was made. Um, but it is a remarkable object in that it is decorated with Christian scenes. It's datable to the mid-13th century, at the time when the Crusader Wars were going on. I see, I see. Is that Mary and, yes. and Jesus? In the very center, you have Mary and Jesus. And then you have a scene of the Nativity, you have uh, entrance into Jerusalem, and you have the baptism. Now, um, given the Christian communities in Syria and in Iraq at that time, um, originally, the canteen was, um, has been attributed to Syria, but now there is more scholarship that it was probably made in Iraq. And there are two different materials here. Is that because they're in different places? Why were there two different materials used? It was probably made in this typical technique, which is a base metal, and then inlaying it with silver that gives it this shiny quality. Now, the other canteen that you see in the back has nothing to do with this in, in, in many ways other than its shape because that was made in China. And the reason that we put the two together here and we're fortunate to have a Chinese object is because as far as we know, there's no other example of this type of object that has survived in the Islamic world. This is the only one that we know of. But somehow there are a number of Chinese objects in a similar shape made in blue and white porcelain. Slightly later, from the 14th century, and again, this adds to the puzzle. Um, how did um, an object like this, did it travel to China? Did the design travel to China? Did it, I, so we don't really know. And the reason that they're sort of put together here is, is to raise questions. This is an example of something so small being so valuable. Tell me about the beaker. The most frequently illustrated text in Iran, actually in the entire Islamic world, are illustrated copies of the Book of Kings, the Shahnameh. And most of these works date from the 14th century on. Now, what we have here is a, as you say, a small cup which is, again, unique in the entire history of the Islamic world um, because it is illustrated with an entire narrative cycle from the Shahnameh. And um, this is way before comic strips became popular. And the scenes are arranged in these strips going around in three bands that you can see. Another aspect that is remarkable about 
this cup is that it dates from the um, early 13th century and it predates by at least 100 years any illustrated version of this story on paper. So this is one of the earliest, actually it's the earliest um, representation of a story from the Shahnameh that we, we know about. So it's very important. Now, you said these are Iranian pieces, but I see Asian mm -hmm. faces. Does this have anything to do with the Mongols? When we think of Iran, usually, I mean today, we think of its current boundaries. But in the um, 12th, 13th century, when all of these pieces were actually made, the boundaries of Iran were very different. It included much of Central Asia, and in, in many ways, sort of ethnically, it was sort of a different mix than it is today and much larger. So you very much get um, Asian features on not only ceramics, but also on other objects. And also in poetry, it's very important to bear in mind that the ideal beauty sort of follows um, what we would consider an, an Asian model today, moon-faced beauty with almond-shaped eyes, a you know, small nose, a bud-like mouth. So these are all um, characteristics that, that if, we, if we have to characterize it today are sort of more East Asian than West Asian. You guys have an entire exhibit devoted to Iranian art right next door in the Sackler Gallery, is that right? Yes. Let's go check that out. Okay. Dr. Farhad also took us below the Sackler Gallery, which opened in 1987 to house gifts of some 1,000 works of Asian art from Dr. Arthur Sackler. In addition, it hosts contemporary art from Asia and international loan exhibitions. Their exhibit of ancient Iranian metalwork just opened in February. This piece just grabs your attention immediately. What is this piece for? This piece is sort of the finale of the, of the exhibition. This is a rare object that actually is in gold. Uh, solid gold. Yes, it's quite thin, but it's solid gold. There are not that many objects uh, like this that have survived because um, gold was the, gold vessels were the first objects to be melted down in times of economic crisis and there were many economic crises at the time. Now, I've noticed some other plates in this gallery. What makes this one stand out? This is one of the stars of the collection. And in fact, it's the first Sasanian object that the Freer Gallery acquired. And one of the first Sasanian objects that actually uh, entered the United States in the 1930s. It is an image of the Sasanian ruler Shapur II. It is made out of 19 separate pieces. It is silver and uh, uh, with added gilt pieces like the, um, like the leg of the horse and the head of the king itself as well. But if you look at the other plates, they are much more simply made. They only, the design is only sort of carved in, whereas here it actually sort of stands out. The fact that it's made out of 19 parts uh, says that, it, that it's much finer um, quality and also when you look at the details of it it's quite remarkable the face of um, the king is really um, exquisitely rendered. How do you tell which king is on the plate? Well you can do that by the crown that he is wearing and that's been very important for scholars of Sasanian art so you because the figures look more or less the same but it's the crowns that identify the various kings. On Sasanian coins you have uh, the image of the king with his distinctive headgear or crown and based on those coins you can identify the figures on the plates and this is Shapur II who was the longest reigning Sasanian ruler he ruled for 70 years and the reason that he had such a long reign was that apparently he was crowned in his mother's womb. Ah, oh. and we're right here on the mall. Mm -hmm. There are cultural activities going on all year long. What do you at the Sackler and Freer Galleries do to help bring the community in? 
Well, we have, um, we have many events going on in conjunction with the exhibitions. We have visitors from all over the world. So we try to have events all the time, whether it's films, concerts, lectures, educational programs. And in conjunction with um, actually the opening of this exhibition and our Persian programs in general, we have a large celebration of Nowruz. With spring coming, we'll get even more visitors and hopefully um, they will come and see this exhibition as well. Yes, well thank you for taking us around today. Thank you very much. And that's it for this edition of Perspectives. Goodbye. This is a voice speaking from America. On Tanya's news and information. Core values. Objective. Honest. What it means to be free. If I heard it on the Voice of America, I could not but believe it. This is the voice of America. There are two guys going down the Red Square in Moscow and one of them is making and the other asks, what are you doing? He said, I'm jamming Voice of America inside me. January 27, 1926, Scottish inventor John Baird presented the first successful public demonstration of television. I have been working as a radio MC, radio producer, television anchor, reporter, editor, video journalist. When we originate content, we are originally for radio, TV, and internet. Uh, during my service in the United States at Congress, uh, I took the initiative in creating the internet. The voanews.com website uh, became one of the top 10 internet destinations uh, on Google. We have evolved as an organization. I personally uh, never look to the past and say those were our best days or best years. No, I'm looking to the future. Yeah, we are all in one.